During the halftime break, I switched the system to live assist mode and played a recording that showed my wife's betrayal. My friends often call me Skip. I serve as a broadcast engineer at WKLP, a regional NBC station based in Denver, Colorado. I hold a master's degree in electrical engineering and computer science from Stanford, and I also earned an additional degree in broadcasting technology. I've been in this profession for a solid 25 years, having taken on numerous demanding roles before settling down here in Denver. Over the last eight years, I've moved between various TV stations throughout the Midwest. I'm now 52 years old, with dark brown hair, standing at 6 feet 2 inches, and tipping the scales at around 185 pounds. Some folks might say I have a decent appearance, though I certainly don't fit the mold of a TV star. For the past 25 years, I've been married to Karen, and we have two sons, Jason, who has already married, and Nathan, who has just about to graduate from high school. Karen is about 5 feet 6 inches tall, weighs roughly 140 pounds, and has long brunette hair. She's a true gem, both inside and out. Currently, she works as a secretary for Reverend Jim Collins, the pastor of our church, and she has been at that job for the last two years. Now, let me share what happened last Thursday. I had a bit of extra time during lunch and thought I'd surprise Karen by taking her out. I parked near the back entrance of the church office because it was raining, and I wanted to get as close to the door as possible. However, when I arrived, I found Karen's office empty. Still, I decided to go inside, and as I waited, I overheard Karen having a conversation with Pastor Jim in his office. She was eagerly anticipating Tuesday night and mentioned how fortunate it was that I worked on the Tuesday night basketball games for the station because it provided us with time to be together. She also inquired about a reservation at the lodge. Pastor Jim reassured her that everything was taken care of, saying he had secured the deluxe suite once again. Come over here and I'll show it to you right now, he added. I then heard the sound of clothing rustling followed by Karen's soft moans. I was utterly stunned, on the verge of feeling ill, and my anger was rapidly rising. I knew I needed to leave before I did something reckless. I couldn't bear to listen any longer. The urge to burst into the room and confront them was strong, but I hesitated, aware that I might lose control and resort to violence, given my emotional state at that moment. I was certain I'd end up physically attacking both of them. However, I didn't want to deal with the consequences of my actions, so I made the difficult choice to walk away. It was one of the hardest things I have ever had to do. Although I wanted to explode in rage, I managed to leave. I was confident neither of them noticed my presence or knew I had been there. The church had security cameras monitoring the main entrances, but I had entered and exited through the rear door unnoticed. I was so deeply shaken that I knew I wouldn't be able to concentrate for the rest of the day. I called my workplace, told them I wasn't feeling well, and that I needed to go home. I needed time to process what had just happened, and being at home seemed like the best option. Karen wouldn't be home until after 7.00 p.m., giving me plenty of time to gather my thoughts. It became painfully clear that Karen was involved in an affair with Pastor Jim, and I decided that I could no longer regard him as my pastor. What I truly needed was to uncover the full extent of their relationship, how long it had been going on, and what had led to it in the first place. While I understand that some people might prefer not to dig into such details, believing they are irrelevant, I am not one of those people. I was desperate to understand why this had happened in what I had believed was a wonderful marriage. A marriage that, in Karen's view, apparently wasn't as wonderful as I thought. She wasn't the kind-hearted person I had once believed her to be and I was determined to find out the truth. I wasn't weak, and I was resolute in my quest to uncover the facts, making sure that both of them would face the consequences of their actions. Once I reached home, I brewed a pot of coffee and stepped outside to sit on the porch, hoping that the refreshing weather and fresh air would help me think more clearly. I needed to make sense of everything that had just happened. I want to deny that I shed a few tears that afternoon because I did. I understand that I don't own Karen or her body, but it hurt deeply to think that she had been intimate with another man, or perhaps more, despite the promises she made to me on our wedding day. Some might not take those vows seriously, but I did, and I believe she did too. Situations like this make you question your entire set of beliefs 
and wonder if you've been naive all your life for believing in faithfulness, love, and everything that comes with it. No matter what anyone says, the most damaging aspect of a cheating partner isn't just the physical betrayal, it's the loss of trust in them and everything they say or do. It is like, throughout your entire marriage, you thought they had your back, but now you realize they don't, leaving you feeling exposed and scared. Despite being six feet two inches tall and weighing 185 pounds, I felt vulnerable and afraid. It highlights how profoundly a cheating spouse can impact a person's emotional well-being. As I sat there, wrestling with my emotions and trying to stay calm and rational so I could process everything, I realized there were things I had questioned in the past but dismissed because of the trust I had in Karen. These were small things that didn't seem important at the time, but now they formed a heavy lump in my stomach as I connected the dots. How could I have been so foolish? The answer was simple trust. I had placed my trust in her, and today that trust lay shattered. What I needed now were cold, hard facts. I wanted to know why this had happened. I needed to understand the duration, frequency, locations, and whether anyone else was involved. My trust had evaporated, and I was determined to find the answers I needed. Here is an update I didn't think I could face Karen just yet without betraying my emotions. So at 4.30 p.m., I made the decision to leave the house before she returned. I drove into town and stopped by the station to grab a few things I'd need for the next few days. I dropped by my boss's office and requested a few days off early in the week, explaining that I was dealing with personal issues and wasn't he feeling well. He agreed, so I left and went to Sammy S. to kill some time until I had to head home. Around 6.00 p.m., I called Karen to let her know I'd be staying out for a while and wouldn't be home for dinner. She sounded irritated and mentioned how she was feeling affectionate that night and that I would have been in for a treat. However, I already had plans, so I told her to keep the mood alive for me, assuring her I'd take care of her when I got home. She replied sharply, Dante, count on it, mister. If you think you can treat me like that, you want to be getting anything for a while. Deep down, I thought to myself that this was exactly what I wanted to happen. I arrived home around 11.00 p.m., feeling quite buzzed, but not so drunk that I didn't notice the bedroom door was shut and locked. I smirked at that and knocked on the door to see if she was awake, though I doubted it. I yelled, fine, if this is the game you want to play, then don't expect any intimacy from me. Just deal with it. With that, I headed to the spare bedroom. The next morning when I got up, she was sitting at the kitchen table, sipping her coffee. I could tell her coffee had gone cold when I walked in. Even if I hadn't known she was unfaithful, I certainly would have sensed something was wrong. I gave her a friendly smile and said, no need to get up and make breakfast, honey. I'll grab something on my way to the tennis court. I then left the kitchen, went to the garage, loaded my tennis gear into the trunk, and drove off. Shortly after, my phone rang, and I saw it was her calling, so I chose not to answer. A few minutes later, I heard the familiar beep, signaling she had left a voicemail. I listened to it, and her message was filled with anger, asking how I could do this to her and demanding I return immediately. The truth was, I had no intention of playing tennis. I had used that as an excuse to buy myself a few hours to handle what needed to be done. My destination was my former church. The last thing I wanted was to hear Jim preach again. It was still early when I arrived, so I figured there was a good chance no one would be around, and I was right. I entered the building, having a key since Karen worked there. I made my way directly to the offices with the intention of placing hidden micro cameras and mini microphones in both her office and Jim S. office. It didn't take me long to get everything set up, and I concealed the transmitter behind some old hymnals in the supply closet across the hall. I had the receiver in my car S trunk, wired into my vehicle S electrical system. This way I could monitor their conversations and activities whenever they were in their offices. While I didn't expect them to do much at the church, I was confident that I would gather valuable information by observing and listening to them over a few days. Once I was certain everything was working correctly, I snooped through her desk but found nothing significant. However, I did notice a large asterisk marked on her calendar for Tuesday, which coincided with what I had overheard on Thursday. I would be ready for whatever might happen on that day. Next, I entered Jim S. office and conducted my search there. I didn't have much luck finding anything incriminating, but just when I thought I was out of options, inspiration struck. It was ironic, given that I was in a church. 
but I had a thought I decided to check the filing cabinets for church expense receipts. To my surprise, I found a file containing several receipts from the Bay Lodge in Springfield. Some were from late 2018, and a couple were from the summer of 2019. Realizing I was pushing my luck by staying too long, I quickly made copies of the receipts to take with me. I then tidied up everything and made my exit. My next stop was the tennis court, where I parked in my usual spot. I made my way to the clubhouse and headed toward the bar. I wanted to ensure a few people there would remember seeing me. I found a table in the back and ordered a soda, spending a couple of hours there. During that time, I closely examined the receipts and discovered that the two from late 2018 were both for Tuesdays, and the two from the summer of 2019 matched up exactly with dates when I had attended a conference at NBC headquarters in Los Angeles. What infuriated me the most was that Jim had the nerve to charge those motel rooms to the church, disguising them as conference room rentals for meetings. He was renting a room with my wife in a motel, and I had unknowingly footed the bill while we had been donating to the church. I decided that there would be no more donations from me. Their day of reckoning was approaching, and all I needed was a bit more evidence to finalize their downfall. I was convinced this affair had been going on for nearly a year, if not longer, which matched the hints I had picked up on earlier. My gut told me that Jim had been involved with her even before she started working for him. She had a decent job as a receptionist at Mallory Corporation, but she eagerly jumped at the chance to work for the church, telling me, Honey, it'll be so close to home, and I'll be working for the church. What could be better than that? Plus, the pay is almost as good as what I was making at Mallory. How can I pass this up? It sounded perfect closer to home, working for the church, and nearly the same pay. However, it was clear she was more interested in the extra perks. I couldn't believe how blind I had been. It made me furious. But it also sickened me to think that my loving wife could betray me like this. I was determined to make them pay for what they had done. I decided it was time to do some investigating. I went out to my car and connected my iPod to the receiver I had in the trunk. After scrolling through a few minutes of data, I saw Jim enter his office. He picked up his phone and made a call. I regretted not placing a bug on his phone, but there was nothing I could do about that now. I had to settle for hearing one side of the conversation. Yes, Karen, I am at the church. I came right after you called me. Why don't you tell me what is bothering you? I thought, has he ever done this before? I see. What do you think set him off then? He asked. Do you think he is suspicious of anything? Karen chuckled before responding. He continued. All right, well, you can get back at him on Tuesday night. After hanging up, he sat there lost in thought. Just as I was about to shut down the transmission, he mumbled something almost inaudible, but I managed to catch it. I made sure to save that soundbite knowing it might come in handy later. After shutting everything down, I drove back home. I figured it might be a bit chilly, so I started mowing the lawn and took care of some chores in the basement. When I walked in, she didn't say much to me, but the tension in the air was thick. During dinner, I chose to ignore her, and she just sat there staring at me. Eventually, she tried to start a conversation by asking what had been bothering me lately and why I had been acting so strangely. I reminded her that she had locked me out of our bedroom the previous night and that I rarely went out with my friends. I pointed out that the one time I did, she had become upset and made threats, so the situation was a result of her actions, not mine. In frustration, she cursed at me. I noted that her language didn't align with the behavior expected of a devout Christian woman, considering her strong faith. Her reaction clearly showed guilt on her face, and I couldn't understand how she thought I wouldn't notice. Nonetheless, she managed to pull herself together and eventually left the table. I thought to myself that when everything finally came to light, she wouldn't handle it well. Later that evening, she came into the family room where I was watching TV, her eyes slightly red, suggesting she had been crying. The rest of the evening passed without any major incidents. When I was ready for bed, I walked down the hallway to the spare bedroom and settled in. A few minutes later, she entered the room and stood there. I asked her, What do you want? She asked, Aren't you going to come to bed? I replied, Nope. You've made it clear there won't be any intimacy in the near future, so I might as well get a good night's sleep alone in here. With that, she left the room in tears. Honestly, I didn't care. On Saturday morning, she woke me up at 10.00 a.m., dressed for church and asked if I wanted to join her. I declined, 
saying I had no intention of going. She left the room with a certain expression on her face indicating she was beginning to grasp the situation. Later, she left the house, and we didn't exchange many words throughout the day, each retreating to our respective spaces. Tuesday morning, I left the house without running into her or engaging in conversation. She called me, her voice filled with tears, apologizing and expressing her love. I told her we to talk about everything when I got home that evening and then hung up. Next, I called my boss to inform him of my day off, while assuring him that I was still available to cover the Tuesday night basketball game. He was satisfied with my response and asked how things were going. I told him everything was going as expected. My next stop was the Bay Lodge in Springfield. There I was, walking into the motel lobby, trying to look like a typical guy doing his job. I noticed the clerk, a young guy named Tyler, who seemed more interested in his phone than in the comings and goings around him. I walked up to him, clipboard in hand. Hey, I've got a service call for the deluxe suite, I said, tapping on the fake work order ID prepared something about the AC making noise. You know how it is with this heat, right? Tyler glanced over the clipboard, his brow furrowing slightly. I kept my expression neutral and professional. Which room? He asked, sounding a bit confused. I gave him the suite number, and for a moment I thought he might see through my ruse. But then he just nodded, handed me the key card, and said, Make it quick, all right? I was in the room in no time, dropping my tool bag, but instead of tools, I had my high-tech gear mics, cameras, and the like. I was playing the role of a maintenance guy, but what I was really doing was setting up a sting operation to catch my wife in the act. Setting up the equipment was a breeze. I hid everything so well that no one would ever know it was there. I left the room just as quickly as I had entered, giving Tyler a nod as I walked out. All set. No more noise from that AC, I told him, and he barely looked up from his screen. I left feeling a bit like a spy, to be honest. Tyler had no idea, and I was one step closer to discovering the truth about my wife. Wild, right? With plenty of time on my hands, I decided to take care of a few other tasks. I needed to get prepared. I went to our bank and got cashier S checks for half the funds from both our checking and savings accounts. After that, I canceled our joint credit cards. Then, I contacted my broker and set up a meeting for just after lunch to discuss adjustments to our investment accounts. I also reached out to my attorney to talk about the divorce and other legal matters. We scheduled a meeting for later in the afternoon when he would be available. Next, I drove to Parker National Bank in Boulder, Colorado, where I opened new accounts in my name only and deposited the cashier S checks. I grabbed lunch in Boulder, although I didn't too have much of an appetite. After lunch, I went to my broker S office to review the investment portfolio changes he had prepared. These changes split our investments equally without selling any assets to avoid unnecessary tax implications. I took the paperwork with me. After that, I met with my attorney to go over the divorce papers he had drafted. I proposed a no-fault divorce with an equal division of assets if my wife agreed to sign immediately. If she refused, I had him include a provision to file for divorce on the grounds of adultery. I was pretty sure she'd sign them right away. With everything in order, all that was left to do was get dinner and head to the station to oversee the Tuesday night basketball broadcast. After leaving my attorney's office, I turned on my phone and found a couple of messages from Karen. In her messages, she expressed concern and asked me to come home before the game, saying she was deeply worried about my recent behavior. She declared her love for me and how torn apart she felt seeing me like this. Even though I knew about her plans for the night and she didn't know I knew, she still sent me these messages. It made me question my judgment, wondering if I was the biggest fool for ever loving and trusting this woman. I had made a decision, the only chance of saving our marriage rested on whether she would show up at the motel tonight. Her choice would reveal whether she cared enough to try to salvage our relationship, acknowledging its fragile state. At 7.0 p.m., I activated the system in fully automated mode, and the Tuesday night basketball broadcast began. I configured the system to monitor the feed from the motel room. At exactly 7.30, Jim walked into the room and made a call, saying, Hey, baby, I am in the room. Get over here as soon as you can. Karen replied, Okay, honey. I'll be there in a few minutes. After hanging up, he muttered a few more words that I overheard, though I'd need to listen to the recording later to catch every detail. My marriage seemed to be unraveling, and while I didn't expect her to end it, the pain still cut deep. 
This only strengthened my resolve to make them face the consequences. I took out my list of people to call and started dialing a task that took almost half an hour. Karen had already arrived at the motel, so I returned to monitoring the video and audio feed. She expressed, Oh God, Jimmy, the thought of being with you excites me so much. I really cherish these nights together, she confided. In response, Jimmy invited her closer, saying, Tonight, darling, I'm going to fulfill all your desires. She responded, I love it when you talk like that, Jimmy. My heart sank, and a wave of nausea hit me. Here was a pastor and a church secretary, along with the woman I once loved, descending into a level of depravity I couldn't comprehend. In the moments that followed, I would witness just how twisted things could get. They both deserved every consequence that was coming to them, there was no doubt. She positioned herself on the bed, and I couldn't bring myself to describe what happened next. The person who had once been my beloved wife was now someone I didn't recognize. He finished his act, and I realized that our future together was shattered beyond repair. Though I was consumed by agony, my simmering anger kept me focused. If they had seen me in that moment, they might have cowered in fear and dread. By that point, I had lost much of my humanity. My sole purpose was to see them brought to justice. After enduring their actions for 30 minutes, I had seen enough. It was halftime during the basketball game, and it was time for the halftime show. I switched the system to live assist mode and began playing back the recording of Jim and Karen from the beginning. Within minutes, the phone began ringing nonstop. I chose to ignore the calls and took out my phone. I dialed Karen S number, and the ringing echoed through the monitors. She looked at her phone and said, "It S skip. I'm not answering this time. Let us see how he likes it. I hung up and dialed again. I suppose I should answer it, she finally said, picking up her phone from her purse. Karen answered with a venomous tone when I greeted her. Hello, she spat. Curious about her whereabouts, I asked where she was and what she was doing. She explained that she had gone shopping since I hadn't called earlier and planned to grab some food before heading home. In a somewhat sarcastic tone, I asked if she was shopping at the moment, to which she confirmed and added that she intended to spend a lot of money. Unable to hold back, I sarcastically thanked her for being such a wonderful wife. In response, she snapped at me, telling me not to speak to her that way and expressing her confusion over my recent behavior before abruptly ending the call. There she was, using that word again. No, Karen, the real issue was Pastor Jim in your motel room. As their activities appeared to be winding down and she was taking one last shot, I considered interrupting it. Knowing she wouldn't answer her phone again, I dialed the motel number. Tyler, idiot skip. Are you watching Tuesday Night Basketball? No? You should be. Could you ring the deluxe suite for me? After just two rings, Jim picked up. Hi, Jim. Can I speak to Karen? She came back on the line, asking why I was calling. Well, Karen, it is like this. I know you have been unfaithful, and I am well aware of where you are and what you are doing. I am going to file for divorce, and you will find yourself without a place to stay. Jim might face some consequences, too. Confused, she asked. What are you talking about, Skip? I can make sense of your behavior lately. What is going on with you? I simply replied, Karen, the game is over. I suggest you turn on Tuesday night basketball and enjoy the halftime show. I'll see you later. Goodbye. I watched on the live monitor as she turned on the TV and tuned into the game. Oh my God, no, she screamed as she watched the footage of herself and Jim in their tryst. The live feed had a slight delay, so she witnessed a significant portion of what the entire Denver area had already seen. Her response was limited to repeating, Oh no as she quickly got dressed and fled the room. Jim was equally frantic, cursing under his breath. I'll kill that son of a bitch. I'll kill him, he muttered, unaware that his words might come back to haunt him. Once they had left the room, I quickly shut off the monitors and let the video stream continue for another minute. Then I turned off the live assist mode and returned the system to full automation. I took the tape and left the broadcast booth, knowing it might be my last visit there. I grabbed a few personal items from my desk as well. Final update, I spent the rest of the night at Sammy S. And yes, my halftime performance became the hot topic at the bar. After the game ended, I called a cab and went home. When I arrived, I found Karen sitting alone in the dark living room. The phone had been disconnected, and it was clear she had been crying uncontrollably. Her tears didn't move me, our marriage was over. She cried and asked, How could you do this to me, Skip? 
After all these years together, how could you? I responded firmly, no, Karen. The real question is, how could you do this to me? I am drunk and I am going to bed. We can talk tomorrow. She didn't move as I left the room and went to the spare bedroom. The next morning, I woke up with a terrible hangover and she was still on the couch with dark circles under her eyes. It looked like she hadn't slept at all, but I didn't care. She had brought this on herself. I casually put the phone back on the hook and it immediately started ringing. For the next hour and a half, I took calls from family members, including her parents, friends, church acquaintances, my former boss, and both of my sons. They were deeply disturbed by what they had seen, and nothing I said could comfort them. I knew it was harsh for them to witness what they did, but they were adults, and they would eventually get over it. I also received a call from Mrs. Jim, who asked if I had kept a tape of the whole incident. I assured her I had a copy safely stored and would give it to her if needed. It was clear that everyone I had contacted had watched the Tuesday night basketball halftime show, and they didn't hesitate to let me know. Some were angry because of the explicit content, while others, like Karen S. parents, thought my actions were awful for exposing her like that. However, most people were sympathetic and understood my point of view. It was a tough ordeal, but it was the price I had to pay for my actions. Karen stayed on the couch, crying throughout the entire ordeal. Eventually, I took the phone off the hook again and went to make some coffee. When I came back, I offered her a cup and handed her the divorce papers and investment documents she needed to sign. I said, Karen, I'm filing for divorce after discovering your infidelity and seeing what I did last night. It's clear you've been cheating on me for at least a year or longer. There is no way I can continue in this marriage. I held up the papers. These are the divorce documents, and if you read them, you'll see I am requesting a no-fault divorce with an equal division of our assets. If you want to move forward, you need to sign both the divorce agreement and the investment split agreement right now. There want to be any negotiations or changes to these documents, they are entirely fair to you. I explained, I'll give you until 7.00 p.m. today to consult with an attorney and confirm that my offer is fair. At 7.00 p.m., the deal is off the table and I'll file for divorce on the grounds of adultery. I'll go after a property distribution based on our individual contributions, with mine being much greater than yours, as well as our incomes. In short, I'll take everything I can. Let me be clear, this is the best deal you're going to get. So think about it seriously. I warned her, and in the end, it would be foolish to contest a divorce based on adultery when everyone in Denver knows it's the truth. Everyone will know you've been unfaithful. This is what you wanted, as I overheard you tell Jim your wish has been granted and now everyone knows it. Take the deal, Karen. Desperately, she pleaded, Skip, I love you, and I want to save our marriage. Can we try to work this out? I responded firmly, That may be true, Karen, but it doesn't matter. Love isn't the issue. I want to stay married to you. Our marriage ended when you chose him over me, and whether you believe it or not, that decision was made when you had your affair with him. Now I suggest you freshen up and talk to an attorney. Time is running out, I advised. Later that afternoon, she returned home with the signed papers. My attorney recommends that I sign these papers, Skip. He thinks you have made a fair offer given the situation, and he advises me to take this settlement, she said. Skip, can we talk? Can you listen to me and maybe consider forgiving me and working together to save our marriage? I agreed to sit down and listen because I truly wanted to understand why she did what she did. I also wanted to know if this was the first time something like this had happened in our marriage. We sat at the kitchen table and she began explaining everything. She confessed that there had been no other affairs before this one. It started just before she began working for Jim. She admitted she didn't really know why because she was perfectly happy with me, but she couldn't deny that she felt drawn to Jim. She mentioned his charismatic personality and the sense that he loved her. So here is Karen. Everyone she's like someone saying my bad after screwing up in marriage. She's apologizing profusely, trying to fix her mistake with tears and a sad expression. It's as if she thinks feeling bad is enough to make everything right, even after not taking her vows seriously. It's like when a dog chews up your homework and then looks cute, thinking you want to be mad. Tough luck, Karen Life S. Not a game, and you can just say sorry and expect everything to be okay. It seems like just being sorry isn't he enough right now. I acknowledged Jim S. charisma but shattered her illusions when I played back two sound bites I had saved. The first was Jim muttering on the first day, that idiot better make sure her husband doesn't find out about our affair. 
The second sound bite was from the room just before she arrived. I'm going to use her tonight. Tomorrow I'll dump her. If she causes any trouble, I'll threaten to tell Skip that should keep her in line. I can risk her husband finding out about our affair and exposing everything. So Karen, not only did you destroy our marriage, but you were wrong about Jim S. feelings for you, I pointed out. No, Karen, there's no way I could continue our marriage for two reasons. First, you broke our vows, and I can to live with that. Second, you would never be happy with me again. I could never make you happy after this. No, Karen, no matter how much love might still be there, it wouldn't be enough to repair the damage you've done to our marriage. She just sat there crying, knowing that what I said was true. In the end, she signed both sets of papers. I told her I would move out, giving her time to find a new place to live. I didn't think she could afford the house, and honestly, I didn't want to stay there either. Our agreement was that the house would be sold and the profits split evenly, just like our other assets. Besides, the house held too many memories that I wanted to leave behind. I gathered the paperwork and bags I had packed the day before and left the house. I went to my broker S office to drop off the papers and then checked into a hotel for the night. The next morning, I met with my attorney. We discussed the divorce papers, and he agreed to file them with the Superior Court of our county that same day. During our meeting, we also talked about the trouble I found myself in at the station and with the FCC. My attorney explained that the FCC could issue civil fines, revoke broadcasting licenses, or deny renewal applications. Additionally, those found guilty of violating these regulations in federal court could face criminal fines and a maximum prison sentence of four years. Given the circumstances, my attorney thought jail time was unlikely, but substantial fines and the end of my broadcasting career were inevitable. I would have to find a new line of work. In just a few days, the consequences of my actions became painfully clear. I was served with legal notices from the FCC and had to prepare for several days in court to defend myself. I wanted to bore you with the details, but the fine imposed on me was nearly two years' worth of my salary, draining my savings. Even worse, my broadcasting license was revoked, and I was banned from working in my field for the next four years. However, there was a silver lining. Tony had seen the Tuesday night basketball broadcast, and despite the illegality and pettiness of my actions, he showed me compassion. He offered me a job with responsibilities that complied with the FCC's restrictions. It seemed he had gone through his own troubles in his recent divorce, particularly with Lisa S. daughter and Ben S. sister, which may have softened his stance toward me. I guess I had Tony to thank for that. In the end, Jim confronted me once at Sammy S. He looked ready to throw a punch, but somehow, I managed to grab his arm tightly. Listen, Jim, I don't ever want to hear from you again, got it? I said firmly. He grumbled, fine by me. I felt like giving him one last warning. Jim, I have an audio recording of you threatening me. If I take it to the police, I could get a restraining order against you and possibly press assault charges. With the evidence I have, you could end up in jail. Is that what you want? He shook his head in disagreement. As I gave him one last shove for emphasis, I added, then this is the last time we'll see each other. He is no longer a pastor. He lost his job at the church, and the denomination revoked his license and nullified his ordination. The last I heard, he was working at a small travel agency in a nearby town. His wife divorced him on grounds of adultery, and she got a substantial settlement. As for me, I am moving on with my life. It is not perfect, but I am finding ways to be happy. I've dated a few women over the past year, but nothing serious. When the right woman comes along, I'll marry her. I know it is just a matter of time, and I am willing to wait to find the right person. I occasionally see Karen. We both attended Nathan S. High School graduation and Jason S. First Child S. Baptism. I was polite, but I made it clear I had no interest in being friends or having any relationship with her. It was obvious she wasn't he happy. I could see she was suffering emotionally from our breakup and regretted her actions. But the problem wasn't her regret, it was her betrayal of me and our marriage. If I were a different person, maybe I could forgive her, but my values are firm, and there's little room for compromise. She will have to live with the knowledge that what she gave up for her affair with Jim was me and our life together. I was just an ordinary man who loved her deeply, but she chose to throw it all away. Yes, she let go of me. Unfortunately for her, she also lost any respectability she had.
as anyone who saw her infamous performance during the Tuesday night basketball halftime show knows she is an unfaithful wife. Rumor has it she gets plenty of date offers, but to her credit, she has turned them all down. It's not the best way to live, but I didn't do this to her. She brought it on herself.